My vice principal, whatever you want to call him, he said to me, you won't make it enough in life because you're a fucking loser. His music and his music taste defined some of my early teenage years. And I've always done what I wanted to do, regardless of who told me otherwise. He's a pioneer in his own right. It's taken me 20 years to get what I hear in my head into a computer. Moments in Music. Welcome to Moments in Music, a brand new podcast from Defected Records, where we get to know our guests through the records that define them. And today's guest, it's a guy that has been around the block. Please welcome Oliver Jones, aka Scream. Welcome to Defected. Hello, my love. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. It's nice to see you not like backstage somewhere know, for like, like five for, seconds. For like, yeah, for like literally three minutes. Slubbery, yeah. slubbery kiss and we'll see you later. <laughs> I feel like that has been our relationship for the past like 10 years. That sounds so dodgy, but yeah, yeah it has. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> three, three minute slubby kiss, that's yeah. it. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for choosing all these records today. It feels like there's a proper journey to get through. There's, there's a, yeah, there's a, I've, I've picked moments, I guess, of my life, I guess. Yeah. To a degree. So let's get talking about the first one, Sunship, Try Me Out. Sunship, uh, Try Me Out, the Let Me Lick It mix. Um, so, look, story goes, <laughs> when I was about, I think I was about 11, I was going out, I was seeing a girl, and I was, when you used to have to talk on the house phones. Yeah. And I was speaking to her for ages, and, and so basically the... The phone, uh, up the upstairs phone was outside my brother's room. So my brother's a DJ, worked at Big Apple, et cetera. And I heard us, like, I was sitting there talking to her for probably about an hour into the call, as you did. Like, you rinsed as much as you could, didn't you, on the phone? And um, I just heard the song playing from my brother's room. He just, he sort of, he'd gone from playing hardcore and jungle for years and then sort of got into garbage in the early 90s. Well, about 95, 96, 97. And I just heard the tune, I was on the phone to her. And I just remember hearing the chord change, the first chord change after the, oh, you know when it comes in. <laughs> like, and saying, I stopped talking, I was like, I didn't know. And I swear this to you, it sounds like one of them cliche sort of DJ produce whatever stories. But I swear to you, like I was a kid. And at that time, I didn't, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I played football, whatnot, because the boys did it. Like all the boys played football, do you know what I mean? Mm. And whatever. But I didn't really know where I was at, what I wanted to do. And and it sank. There's a little twinge in my chest. Like, now, if it happened now, I'd probably have to go to the hospital. But it was, um, it, it genuinely, I was like, what just happened there? Is that song still to this day? I get the same feeling. And it was, I remember I went silent on the phone and she wondered if I was still there. And I was just like, I've got to go. And then that was sort of, Honestly, that was sort of that was the start for me, where I was like, I want to, I want that feeling all the time. And was it like it was something that it f it, made you feel? It, yeah, like an emotion. Like yeah, but considering I wasn't listening, like it caught me ear because mm. I had to, I used to have to where the phone was. I used to have to sit against a wall, and then his room was here, my room was there, but it was all sort of on the landing. Yeah, and I was just like, what the fuck just happened there? And it uh, still. It's still, that feeling still, to this day, I try and get that feeling, like when I make songs. Mm. So I try and get sync, I'm like, yeah. Use it as like an anchor point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but it on it, like, I swear to you, like, and with songs I play, I still look for that, that. And it's, yeah. If you had to it. describe it, like. I can't, like, it's, what would it, it, be? It, it As I said, I'd go to hospital now if it happened. <laughs> like, I would, if it, because it was like a, it was like an over bit, I don't know, it just saying, it's, the call change up is why I'm obsessed with, with progressions and, 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 like, it's the same reason why I'm obsessed with um, horror soundtracks and, and movie music, because right. it, it evokes emotion. Right. And it's all because of that song. Honestly, I promise you. That's crazy. Mm. And for the, for those people that like don't know, your brother Hijack. Hijack, yeah. Yeah. So he was originally part of Internati with um with Groove Rider Bailey, um, Ice Man. Um, he worked at the originally the second floor of Big Apple Records, which is the famous record shop from Croydon, which I ended up working in, thirty seven Surrey Street Market. It's gone now. Two now bars. Um, but um, yeah, it was sort of became the home of dubstep. Became it was just it was the one of the it was actually the number one defected seller in London. Oh really? Yeah, <laughs> that's a true story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Simon will tell you that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was yeah, it was it was just a pub 
but I ended up working there later on. Well, I started working there when I was about 13 because I just wouldn't leave. And they said to me one day, if you're going to hang about, get behind the, behind the jump. <laughs> um, but yeah, but yeah, so he, he's the reason why I used to break into his room scratch all his records like I'm not talking I ain't talking A-track scratching my brother was a scratch DJ ironically but um, I used to break and ruin his records he ended up having to put a lock on the door which I then managed to break <laughs> um, I broke it so bad once I couldn't put it back together nearly killed nearly killed us um, but yeah it was um, yeah he was he's a legend still is yeah amazing DJ yeah I remember seeing him a lot around when I was younger when yeah. I was like 17 18 used to go to forward yeah, and it was always it was always too. with it. Yeah. Always, well, yeah. Because it, it, the the first forward I went to, one of the first, I think. Well, I went to the first one, and I was only allowed to go. I was I had school the next morning, and I was only allowed to go if he'd come. If he'd go, right. He didn't particularly want to go, <laughs> and he had to come out for me to be able to go. How old were you at that point? Fifteen. Was it? It wasn't a plastic people. No, that it, was point, was it? Uh, it was a uh, velvet rooms. Yeah, velvet yeah. rooms. Yeah, it was Slimsy and Maxwell D. I think the first one. Yeah, dub plate only because that was the thing. It all stemmed from um, from a Big Apple Christmas party where they come up with the idea that everyone has to can only play dub plates only, <laughs> that no song was released, and that was where Sarah Lockhart and Neil Jaloffy got the idea for forward from mm. from that Christmas party. And what was um, before we kind of get into like Big Apple and stuff? I know you've told that mm. story a lot of times, but. Like school for you, you said you didn't know what you wanted to do. You wanted to be a footballer, but then you weren't sure and you I heard this record. I, I didn't necessarily want to be a footballer. It was just one of them things. I played football in primary school. Yeah. And then you just, it's one of them things, it's an easily social thing. Yeah. Like all the boys do it and all your mates do it. So you do it. I was, I was fairly good. Like, well, I wouldn't say it was great, but I mean, my school team was the best in Kent. It's so like Jason Punchin played in my school team and mm -hmm. went on to Palace. Liam Fontaine went up to, I think, Kilmarnock or something. So it was, we used to have Chelsea scouts down watching us play. Mm. But I, I weren't really, it was so intense. Like, if you messed up, there'd be, you'd have to have a fight after. Like, it was that intense because they all wanted to be professional footballers. I'm like, you oh, weren't sure. I yet. was more into girl, like, girls <laughs> and, then, and then I found music and then it was sort of girls' music and then I smoked a lot of weed. So it was like girls' music and. I don't want to take out music and drugs, it's a terrible thing to say. But, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe true. Felt like home, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but it was, um, I felt like I'd found my thing. Mm. And like, some people still haven't found their thing. I was very, very, I still find myself so blessed that, that I found it so early on. And during a really, like, school at that point, my school was a shithole. Like, it was, that my school was, like in context, it was. I don't know if you'll ever remember this, but there was a famous story of the headmistress who stole all the money from the, it. Was so I went to a Catholic school, it was grant maintained, which means that they 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 cook their own books basically without it being public knowledge, right? So, my school, like basic, my school was on the front page of every every paper in the country, and there was a docu there was a like a uh, um, a series called The Phoebe and Headmistress, where Pauline Quirk from Birds of a Feather played my headmistress. Right. She stole all the money, basically, and then there was, we had nothing. Like, it was fucking it was terrible, really. Yeah. If it happened to my son now, I'd be, like, raging on my daughter. But it was... Um, so when when I got music, like, I didn't want to be at school. Like, it was... I always questioned... I didn't question authority, but I knew when... You know when you're getting lied to, and this is the most important thing in your life. This is the most important thing. Mm. It's really, ultimately... You know now, it's actually not. Yeah. Like, unless you want to go into further education where... I didn't really know what I wanted to do and found music. I found music by, say, DJing. And it was just like, oh, I love it. Like, I loved it. I just, then I'd find where I could play. I'd go to social clubs, house parties. Like, then we'll get on to, like, when I met Benny. But it was it was just, I knew what I wanted to do. And I stopped playing football because that was so intense. Because they wanted to be pros. And a lot of them went pro. Yeah. And I was real. And then, but my teachers and that, when I, I remember saying, my last day of school, like, check this for a school. My, like, uh, sh shit, you're not right, this is true. My last day of school, my vice principal, whatever you want to call him, said to me, you won't make it enough in life if you're a fucking loser. Exact words. Right. Exact words. Imagine saying that to a kid. Yeah. Then, literally two years later, I released the first screen album, posted it to the school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, like, Did you down. get a response? <laughs> no, of course I didn't. <laughs> what, what do you think it was? Because I had a similar feeling at school where I felt like, 
you know, it, like higher education you is feel always a bit like alien. Dr- yeah, you feel a bit alien. Do you know what I mean? So we're like drilled into you, like you need to get GC- GCSEs and A levels and go to university and da 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 da. And in order to be successful, or these it, are the things. Oh, you need to it, do. Sorry, it's quite. But yeah. it's if you don't do that, you have to go into manual labour. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. only option. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but there was something inside of me, and I'm not quite sure what it was, telling me that there has to be like an alternative. And yeah, where yeah, did yeah. that come from for you? Just that feeling, that yeah. initial feeling from the Sunship record. Right. And then when, obviously, like, I jumped head it, like head in. And then when when I was so, I was at my mate uh, Luke's house and his, his next, his boy lived around the corner, funnily enough, a boy called Drapsy. And I see him music, making tunes on Music 2000. I put, this was when I was about 12, 13, about 12. And he, I was like, because... Because where I'd go record shop, I'd been up to Arthur's studio. Like my, in in your head, you think you need like a ten grand, fifteen, twenty grand studio, right? Mm. So I was a kid, I'm just learning it. And I see him make music on a on a PlayStation. I was like, no, I'm like no, <laughs> on a PlayStation. You're like, Poof, head blown. Funnily enough, the same boy, his brothers, Section Boys. No oh, right. Turned out to no be way. Section Boys. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 don't, I remember seeing them when they were babies, when they were nappies and that. But yeah, yeah, so I remember ringing it. I remember my mum come pick me up and I made her take me to Curry's or Dixon's or wherever on the way home. I was like, please, can you get me this? And then that was how it started. And then not long after, I met Benga. Uh, um, Big Apple Records was like your sanctuary, wasn't it? Yeah, well, there's a thing. I was at school and it was, it, was the, it was the first place that made, that age didn't matter mm. how people spoke to you. Like you got talked to like everyone else there. Mm. That was what made us feel... It was the first time ever, like, you actually got talked to, like, not shouted at by a teacher or shouted at by, yeah, like, you felt, yeah, you just felt age meant nothing. And that was when I ended up starting to work there. And it was just, it was amazing. Like, it was literally, I, I put I put so much of myself personally, as a, like, as a, how I am, to that shop because they, they give me responsibility. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? I, I got to work the shop. Well, when I was about 15, I got to work the shop on my own on a Sunday. Like, that was it's a big thing, do you know what I mean? Mm. And it was just just being around, just being talked to proper. It's like, it sounds so silly, but at that age, when you feel, already feel like a bit of an alien because you don't know what you want to do, and, and then you find this place that is like, it, it's just, um, just, I don't know, it just made you feel proper. Do you think you still would have found your way into music without that record store? No. Do you think? No, not at all. No, because you know how intimidating records are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. remember going to the black market. I remember telling my mum I was going up the shop. And I ran, got on a bus, got to East Croydon, and God's feet told me I went to black market, got ready or not. No, no, it weren't ready or not. It was something else. But I remember that feeling. I was my, I, In the back of my head, all I was thinking is my mum, like, I should be home by now. Mm. And he said, I'm going up to Woolworths or something. <laughs> And then I remember getting in, getting the record, but I remember how scared I was, because like, you're meant to know what you want. Yeah. And like, I didn't even know what I wanted in life, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, um, but no, I wouldn't be nothing. I wouldn't be the person I am without that shop. And I wouldn't have, um, I wouldn't have met the people I met, which went on to be, it wasn't just, it weren't just normal people, really. If you look at that in hindsight, it was mm. like, I would never have met Benga. It wasn't for Big Apple. I was, well, I was in there on my own one day and boys walked in and gone, are you screaming? And I was like a bit scared because at the time quid and I just don't, a few issues with a couple of people. And he was like, you make tunes in it. He got my brothers just started making tunes as well. Gave me his number. And that's how me and Benga met on the phone. Right. Just ring and play each other's songs down the phone. And then I met, his, but I was like about his brother, Alpha. Shouts to Alfie all the time. Um, and then I met Benny. Benny was like little mad cheeky. He's, like, he's only a year younger than me, but he was because I was arguing about his older brothers. He felt so much younger. Mm. And then we just, pff, I guess the rest is history, isn't it? Like I met Mala, met Lofa, met Koki, Chef. Um, I met everyone via that record shop. Mm. So like really, it, it weren't just a shop for me. It's like literally the blueprint of of what went on to be I'm talking close family friends, like like. Life like my family, do you know what I mean? Mm. Arthur, I've, I've got to mention Arthur, obviously, as well, yeah. do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that, that those people kind of stayed throughout with you throughout your career. I mean, me, Bengal and Coke, you made a record last night. Yeah, oh, really? Mm. Last night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No way. Yeah, I suppose so. 
I'm looking mm. forward to hearing it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's fire. It's proper fire. <laughs> and like staying around that time in your life, mm. one of the other records that you've chosen, Jocelyn Brown. Yeah. Um, somebody else's guy, obviously a bit of a switch up. So that is, that's my mum. Yeah. Like it's, um, it's my mum's favourite song. In my mum's house, there's like a loft going around the house rather mm. than on top. Yeah. And she had, I found all my brother's old records and my mum's records and it was that one. And that's what got me into disco, like properly into disco. Right. It's more funk, but I mean, that was, I'd done a mix um, for Lo I called it. It was called Disc 23 or the Disc 19 or something, Disc something. He's the only person with it. <laughs> and he, he lost, like, I was asking him recently, he's like, you having a laugh? <laughs> if you've got a CD in I was like, that was just when, I met Lo for what when I was, this must have been when I was about 18 maybe. And that was the tune I opened with. And it was more for like fat back band and all stuff like that. But that song is my mum's song. Like I remember at her 50th, I hadn't been about for a while because I'd been touring and whatever. And I remember turning up and I could hear people going, oh, that's Leslie's son, that's Leslie's son, the DJ and whatever. And, and um, I remember getting up and she had a bad back at the time and she was like, she hadn't been having the greatest night because she was in pain. I was like, come on, get up. And we had a proper dance, proper, proper dance. How much impact did your parents, like, musical influence have on you, was it? Like, he's more my brother, really. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, look, my dad used to, my dad was obsessed with Natural Born Killer soundtrack, which is, like, Dre, um, I Iggy Pop, dance like, dance right. like, hey, So I feel like they chicken. did, yeah. But, no, nah, no, nah, it's, it's more in a mental way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, no, nah, no, nah, it's more my brother. And then it's more the record shop and then because behind the record shop was 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 Beano's which was the biggest second hand record shop in Europe yeah so I'd go there on my lunch so it was more in my brother really the hearing because I wouldn't have heard that song I've worked yeah Sonship song yeah so, so that there were my, it wasn't a particularly musical house and like things like somebody else's guy like I'd hear a lot at weddings and my mum would request it so it's, I suppose right. in that way but I mean not massively it wasn't massively musical it was a hectic house but not massively musical yeah. and at what point so you're a, you're a teenager you're working at Big Apple at what point do you start to feel things shift for you when um, well I suppose we was on the front of a magazine when I was 15 so yeah, I actually, was, I was actually remember Juice, Juice magazine. I, f I found the or copy Rewind, of that. It was Rewind, or one of them, Juice or Rewind. I can't remember. Bengal was in Rewind, and then I think we both done Juice, D E U C E. Do you remember? Yeah. Um, I so found I, a copy of it in Rin at Rinse years well, ago. Well, there was, so what was the mini disc era? The mini disc era was. Whenever the mini discs come out, that, yeah. was, when, that was when we started to, to <laughs> feel, because that was when we started taking our tunes in. And it was like. Me and Benny would turn up with like 30 tunes each every week. Or like, not even every week, every other day. And that was when we'd start playing them through the, the, the Jamo speakers in the record shop. And that was the bit where, that was where Neil Jalofi caught wind. That was before Sarah worked for, for Sarah Lockhart like worked for, for ammunition. Mm. And no one would tell him who these boys were that making tunes. Then we was getting like I think the I think the moment where it was like I think for everyone I think anyone who makes tunes I think the moment you realise that it's happening is when you hear your song played in the club. Yeah. Being at school and hearing your song played in the club. If I didn't like if I didn't like being at school anymore, this made me not want to be at school even more. <laughs> do you know what yeah. I mean? Because I I used to get suspended loads. And I just, I wanted to get, I'd get myself to spend on purpose. Because what they used to do is they'd give you a letter to give to mum. Yeah. Absolutely, most backward thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm a good kid. I'm going to go and give my mum a letter to get in more trouble. So what I'd do is I'd pretend to go to school. They'd have to drop me off because they knew otherwise I'd, I'd do a runner. And then I'd, I'd tell you, all right, see you later. Wait for them to drive off. And then I'd run because I was under a shortcut to get to the bus stop. Get on the bus, go home, make tunes. Then buy a, by about two o'clock, I'd go back to the school outside the school and get picked up. And kind of go. <laughs> but it was around that time and about 14, 15. The thing is, it happened, it seemed to happen really quick for us. Like the, the initial part, but we just, because we had each other, me and Benny, it was like this creative competition. So we were like secretly battling, but not battling, but influ influencing each other. Mm. So 
it just, we were rapid. If you ask artwork, he'll tell you, like, we were rapid, how quick the quality got up. But yeah, around that time, it just, it felt like it was happening. And I remember, I remember we went out, we went to Velvet Rooms. So whenever the first Velvet Rooms was, mm. I remember Beggar's tune got played, the tune called The Dose, which came out on his, on the blue Big Apple vinyl. Yeah, I And then mine got played that, so another, I think my song The Bug got played that night and they ended up both coming out on Big Apple. But it was around that time. It was just like, it was just mad, really. It's mad yeah. when I think about it now. Well, you're so young, you're a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the thing is, what's mad, what's proper mad is we thought we were the bollocks then. Like yeah. We thought we'd made it then. Right. And then pff, it was another few years later till Mystics come about. And then, but then we thought we was already like, had long-term career then. Yeah. And then it's just, it's a mad thing of, wow. Like, it's mad being, me being in now. It's like 22 years of Scream. Yeah. Like, actual active Scream. Yeah. And that blows my mind. Do you ever, like, have a minute to, like, stop and think about it? Or is it too yeah, much? Yeah, yeah, it's been a lot. I think lockdown was a very big part, a very, very, very big thing of yeah. actually thinking. Well, because <laughs> everything had been non-stop, non-stop from the minute I left school until lockdown. And I think... That's what it was a part of me while I was so scared during lockdown. Luckily, I had my studio because I was studio and my family. <laughs> Imagine I just said the studio kept me sane. <laughs> um, but um, it was that was it, it was it was more or less every weekend from the minute I left school until lockdown. Mm. And it's you just it's not partic- probably not particularly healthy thing mentally or physically. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. But it's um yeah it's I. I, I'm very, I feel very, very blessed. I'm not sure if I've got old or I'm not sure if it's because of the kids or, or, or whatnot. But I do feel extremely... The amount of people I've seen come and go in all that time yeah. is pretty mad. Like, And we're talking big people to, yeah. to smaller underground producers or whatever. The fact that I'm still here blows, does actually blow my mind. The yeah. fact that I've actually still got an active, fully active fan base. But I'll put that down to my crowd was my age when I was growing up. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't like older or younger, it was my age. Yeah. Like whether it be, I was the same age as the kids at uni that I was playing to. Yeah. So I put that put it down to a lot of that, but I mean, yeah, I've, like I do, I've been sitting out, I've been quite retrospective recently, like hence the scream is a mate and, and stuff like that. It's like, um, I, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it in more now. Like every day I'm like, fuck. And but it's putting more, puts more pressure on you. Like, where you never think about it, and when you do something like, like shit, I've got to fucking make, I've got to keep this thing alive. Yeah, like I've, I've got to have no doubt of that. But it's like I care so much about my fans. I care so much about people I believe in and whatnot. But it's a, that's an extra stress on you. Like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's just how how my head works. Do you feel like I know you you've spoken about lockdown like quite fondly in a way, like a freedom in the studio <laughs> and. In studio wise, yeah. it was it was amazing, right? Because I realised that I hadn't had that much time. Because I've said this before, but when you're in the in the cycle, just gigging. Look, you go out, say Thursday, start gigging on a Thursday, finish Sunday night. By the time you head straight, like to get in the studio, because bear in mind I've got kids, so to be back Monday morning up at six. But, and by the time you're ready to get in the studio, it's Wednesday. And the way I've always made tunes is like bangers because from my dubstep era, so it's like, I've got to make a banger for Friday. Mm. But you had to frazzle, so you end up making like just a banger, not a timeless record, like which, which... And you get wrapped in that for so long. When, I, when luckily, I had a studio built in my house like a few years back. Like it was such a blessing in disguise during lockdown because it was, I fell in love with my machines again and like not just rushing stuff and actually realizing it was when I, it was the point where I realized that I could make more styles than my contemporaries. Cause you're just in clubs all the time, people just making club stuff. Whereas I forgot that I've, I've produced for Miles Kane. I forgot that I've done songs with Achilles. I forgot that I used to do dubstep stuff. I forgot that I used to do garage. I've been making garage records for years. And it was like, it was nice. It was just like, like production wise, I've done like 900 records and not done. Mm. Finished. What? That's mental. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, by the end of the first lockdown, I said to Scott, you know, my manager, yeah. shouts to Scott all the time. Um, I was like, I think I got writer's block, and he's like, I'm not. He said, I want to show you something. 
he showed me like 248 songs. He was, I was like, all right. He was like, fucking sort yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and then it was, I got so much done. I was inventing new genres. Like, I was weird, was going <laughs> mental. Because any time I got stressed, like panicking about going out again, mm. like we didn't know. I was just, I'd just channel that there and I'd go. And because, look, like, because me and Mrs. around each other all the time and it was all right. And it was like, they wanted me to go to the studio. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It was like, it wasn't like, where normally it's like, no one's seen you. Like, where it can sometimes be a bit stressful going to the studio. It's like, kids ain't seen you. Yeah. Like, it, it can sometimes fuck with your, your personal life, you know. But there it was like, they wanted me to go to the studio for a few hours. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, um, it was, yeah, music wise, it was amazing. Financially, it was a catastrophe as it yeah. was for everyone. But, and stress levels were through the roof because that unknowing, where, and especially someone like me who's, who's Music, going into music gave me routine to stop me from being a naughty little bastard, really. Yeah. They like, gave me routine to not, like, I knew what I was doing, especially touring. Like, I knew where I needed to be on each day and I knew where, where I had to be. Right. And it was the first time I didn't have no structure. And it threw us, completely threw us, freaked life out of me. Mm. Because you can fall into old, well, it's not old, but, but I know... Luckily, you couldn't go to the pubs and that, because otherwise I'd have probably just ended up in the pubs and all that and just being a uh, fucking reprobate. Uh, rep, reprobate. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was good. It was, it was, it kept me sane in the studio. Yeah. Like, well, sane from not rip, completely ripping my hair out of panic. Yeah. And you talk about touring, like, well, we spoke about it a little bit off camera, how intense it can be, especially if you've been doing it for 20 mm. odd years. What's your like relationship with touring after all this time? I like flying. Yeah, I've been flying to like my first flight as a, as a baby was to Australia, so I've, I've always done long flights. So I, I generally like flying. I get my best sleep on planes. No way. I think it's the vibrations or the noise or something. But I like the thing is I can never complain about touring because you pick your own battles. Yeah. Right. And I see like I see people who who um, stress out and whatever, but at the same time. Just you only take on as much as you can deal with, and if you, it, that's where the relationship falls out, out of parts. Is if you, you take on more than you can handle for other people's benefit. When really, if you look at it, all them people stressing you out work for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's the bit I try and explain to loads of younger artists because, it's um, it's you don't work for anyone. Yeah. They, everyone around you works for you. Yeah, I think people forget that though. Yeah, if, yeah, listen, your agent, you don't work for your agent. Your agent works for you. You don't work for your manager, your manager works for you. And this, I've always known that. So I take on, look, I'm, I think I'm slightly different. I'm built slightly different. As artwork says, I'll be around with the cockroaches. Like when, if there was Armageddon, <laughs> he says, I'll be around with the cockroaches. But I mean, my I love nightlife. I love people and I love, I love it. Yeah. Like I love it. It's yeah. real life that freaks the life out of me. Right. Because you think, I, I know nightlife, like, that's all I know. Yeah. It was like another thing going back to lockdown, like having to ring mortgage companies and ring, I just didn't know what to, I was doing. Yeah. But why would I? Like, literally, I've just been rolling in and out of clubs for, like, all my life, really. If yeah. you look at it, like, I'm not saying every weekend since I was 11, 12, but, I mean, like, it's well documented how long I've been in clubs, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, touring for me is, is, is sound. It's, uh... It's a comfy bed. Well, apparently. It's what you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's like, I like being in hotels. I like, it's, 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 it gets difficult when you've got kids. Yeah. Like my son understands, he's older, but my daughter, cause she grew up with this in lockdown. She was used to me being there every day, mm. every single day mm. for two years. And she got quite separation anxiety when I started going away cause she thought I wasn't coming back. And it was just weird cause she won't, she didn't, no, she grew up in lockdown. Yeah. And it's, I feel sorry for a lot of kids who grew up in lockdown. Especially kids who were meant to be going to secondary or whatever. Yeah. lot, man, it was a lot. For them, more so than adults, because their life was literally... To, you know, with my daughter, it was she was she was with us. All she knew was me and Chloe in the house. Yeah. So it was that, things like that, when the, ringing your saying, I miss you and stuff, and it's hard to explain to... She sort of gets it now, she's four... She sort of gets it. She like it, I got it into her head that when I'm going away, it's because I'm going to get a present. She knows a DJ. She tells her teachers that my daddy's a DJ. Mm. But like that was our sort of easy. I'd bring, I'd always bring a gift back. Do you know what I mean? So, but it's I try and limit it. I try. I won't go. I don't know. I don't go away for longer than two weeks. I had to 
when quarantine opened in New Zealand because we had to quarantine for 10 got days. Stuck, got stuck twice. Yeah. I ended up quarantined twice in yeah. one trip. That was hard because I was away on Christmas Day as well. Right. And that was horrid. That was brutal. Yeah. And like sitting in a hotel room on your own. Like yeah. that was horrible. But yeah, generally touring is, I find it, I find it easy. If I didn't, um, if it started to, I'd, I'd be completely balls out honest with anyone around us. If I yeah. was like, if it was getting too much. But I mean, it's not, it's not as easy for some as I, I find it because it's, it's all I know. Some people, it's not all they know. Some people get thrown into it and feel don't don't necessarily know the position they stand in, where like that they're the boss really. Yeah. Because it, it can be intense. Like when you got when say you come say you go zero to a hundred yeah, overnight. Yeah. Which a lot of people do. All these people around you. Yeah. Like why you don't even know where you got them there. Luckily, I grew up in, in in a position where I had people at artwork, I had people at Sarah Lockhart, I had people at John from the shop. Do, it was I knew why I had each person, right? Because they was helping me. They wasn't sucking life out of me, yeah. which happens a lot now. Yeah, like so much. I see it all the time, and I've, I've helped so many young producers cut their teams because I remember I asked. I'm not going to mention their name, but I asked <laughs> asked a young producer. I said, "Why have you got a manager?" And he said, "They get me gigs." I said, "Well, why have you got an agent?" I said, "Well, they get me gigs." I said, well, "What are you paying two people to do the same job?" Yeah, I have a manager because it's the, for, the, for the scream side of it as an artist, and mm. I have an agent for to get my gigs. But I understand that. Yeah. But the, it, you'd be so surprised. I, you know, it's, it's a very known thing. I look after. I try and look after as many people as I can. For, for reason my stress levels are so high, and like, that's not from gaining anything. But I like helping people because I have good people look after me, and it's mm. not. There's, there's good people around, but there's not as many. I don't find as many as there used to be. There's yeah. A lot of, is that because you reckon there's, there's rich, more money There's involved? a lot of rich kids on the run. Right. A lot of people have been handed jobs and don't actually understand what they're doing. Yeah. Well, but like, there's going to be... The worst thing is, right, when that goes out, there's going to be so many people think, is he talking about me? Is he talking about me? Is he talking about me? Because <laughs> there's so many. I've, yeah. heard, I've heard some outrageous things um, from people, like, like mad, like from people who are meant to be like in industry. Legit, yeah. Like mental. Talking of like families, we always spoke about Big Apple, but we haven't really touched on rinse yet. Um, obviously Sarah Lockhart went to Rince Genius was there before well I actually my intro to Rince was I went up on a boxing day with um, like plastician and that and, and fabric um, no 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 I went up to Rince oh, okay yeah don't know this was years ago okay and um, it was Uncle Doug's who got me on Rince oh really yeah because he used to run Rince with, with G and Slim yeah and he said to us he promised us he was like bro we've got to get you on here we've got to get you on I've really always got on well with Doug's he's like still to this day we always have like there's always odd catch up here and now but it was Doug's G made it hard for us to get on there he, it makes now. On. <laughs> he made, <laughs> he made it hard for us to get on there because they didn't have dubstep on there right. I tried a show and then um, it was Doug's got my show got me a show on there right and I was thanking for that forever and then that was long before Sarah got involved that was uh, the first time I went up to Rin no, the, this when I got when Doug's told me that it was a Christmas party in Rint Station underneath the kebab shop in uh, on on uh, opposite the Blind Beggar on Roma is not Roma on Bow no where Blind Beggars yeah, yeah. Um, it was under there it was the most dangerous dangerous spot like if there was a fire we were on we'd be like absolute goners but it was I remember Dogzilla Sire but they was all up there there was like full team it was like. I shouldn't have even been there, but I got invited. Like I, I was like a tag along, and uh, that was uh, it. Was like mad. I remember sitting there, and like, because I was a pirate radio kid, like I was massive into pirate radio. Yeah. And it was like all these people I listened to. I was like, right, this is mad. Which is funny because that's how it was for me. Yeah. When you were already on there. Right. Because I was like seventeen when I. I remember. Yeah, yeah, you worked in the office. Yeah, I? I was in the office. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. My first day actually was. Um, uh, when we were on Brick Lane, but not the nicer studio, the one at the back. Yeah, yeah, but uh, opposite at 93 Feet East. Yeah, but That's... it was like the other side of the car park and it was a whole little room. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, downstairs. And then upstairs was Zinc Studio. No, no, no. So before we were in there, uh, yeah, 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 we yeah. across so the road. Up, yeah, 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 yeah. No, oh, oh, so that, yeah. So originally it was, oh, so you know 93 Feet East is? Yeah. If you come out, the right, there was a door there. That's where it initially was. Right, right, right. And then it went to over in um Back where the car park. what's the gaff on the corner? Yeah. The I know club, what you're about. you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, um yeah. Brick Lane. No, it's not ninety three uh, feet, it's ninety 
like near Ross Road? No, no, no. It's, it's where you used to have to walk into. It's that dingy little room we talk about. It's the other side. It's yeah, the, it's other, the other looks side. like an office sort of building, from, not office building, but like with glass doors and that. Do you, do you it's, been, it's been in about four it's or five been, places, yeah, hasn't it? It was this horrible little room and it was like no bigger than where me and you are sat. <laughs> And no windows and it was just a door and like a gated door and my first day well my first like few weeks there was literally just to carry shit from that room <laughs> across the car park yeah. to like some other room yeah 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 and like loads of records and just like 12 tens and like rubbish shit heavy stuff Every, there's heavy, heavy shit stuff. yeah <laughs> and like and then and then I, I got asked to go upstairs in the office and I would kind of just sit there and just do odd jobs or whatever oh I know he's talking about so you're t- when I took you out of the I'm taking the downstairs one. Yeah. You're thinking, talking about the big one upstairs next to the studio. No, not even. Wait, it's There's so, so many, many yeah. because we used to move about a lot. Yeah, we're not getting anywhere. We're no. <laughs> in locations away. But I just remember there just being like piles of like fag butts in the corner and like... Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think so, yeah. And, uh, Do you remember the weird biscuits I used to get sent? Yes. And the boxes? Yeah, but nobody told me about these. <laughs> really? Nobody ever told me about this. I remember coming in once and they've gone, and I see stuff from name and they've gone, look, we didn't want to give them to you we didn't freak you out. We think you've got a stall car. That was proper weird. Yeah, yeah I was getting sent mad, like, luxurious biscuits and like yeah. right, random bits of fabric, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. We once got this <laughs> box and it was like, I don't even know how to explain it. It was like a wooden box that they'd handcrafted and inside of that was like, l- like torn up letters. And, and a head. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we found out it came from somewhere in Europe. Yeah, Germany. So yeah. it's coming from somewhere in Germany. Yeah, but, yeah. I, but basically, Sarah never told me about it because she didn't want me to get scared. She was like, but we, think, know, we, we think you've got a stalker, yeah. That's but so but the thing is, it turned out when we eventually opened the ball, it was like really expensive, expensive luxurious biscuits. I like, I like a biscuit, <laughs> do you know what I mean? We were getting probably like every month. Yeah, yeah. And I think would, it was coming from the same person. Yeah, yeah. It would, it would turn to a bit of a thing in the office, but I had no idea that you yeah, didn't know Yeah, no, she it. didn't tell us because she didn't. Yeah, she thought I'd be freaked out by it. Yeah. Every so often, she'd be like, fucking hell, it's mad that he got It's again. mad that he got They must have just found it on the, on the vinyl address or something. Yeah. But apparently, it was a lot there, yeah. I reckon that it was uh, uh, the address was on the website at that point, but that was when you. To be fair, I'd have done my ego, like the world of good. <laughs> <laughs> got biscuits getting sent from Europe, you know? probably laced with fucking. <laughs> But that's when you were, was that was that when you were around when your album came out? That no, that them, that sort of thing was happening when I did the the rinse CD. Right. Remember, was it volume two or whatever? Yeah. The the when the, the rinse series, yeah, it weren't. It was after. By the time they had that office, the big one, um, that was, I was on rinse. Yeah. Then, that's why I'd always pop in. But yeah, I don't ask. Me. 07 maybe 06, 07. Yeah. Got the CD come in 07, the mix CD. Yeah. So they'd be around in 07, 08. And that was when, it was around the time where Ford was at Plastic People. Yeah. Which, like, those years... Like my youth club. Yeah, it, like, fucking shaped my mm. teenage years. Best thing ever. Yeah, amazing. I was so grateful I was part of it. I listened, I'm, like, I loved that place. Yeah. It got, it got a bit, got a little bit crap towards the end. When the booth changed. Yeah, and it just it, like when Ade went went to build the houses in, in yeah. Africa, I think he went like it, it sort of. No, it's no one's fault, but it was noise restrictions. It was people who didn't have to deal with what they were getting thrown on top of them, and it yeah. was just clientele sort of changed. It was becoming very much more. It's it's always, it was always it was always white, yeah. like very white heavy. But yeah. I mean, it was sort of that. <laughs> That transition from sure that it's a Dawson, I guess. I don't know, like yeah. where it was sort of like post dubstep, I guess. Yeah. And it was sort of, it wasn't that original hub, like where. God, man, I used to be, I used to serve drinks behind the bar in there. Yeah. I used to have my birthday parties every year. I remember having, I'd, I'd, I'd zinc back to back with Randall on one of my birthdays because we'd have, we'd have the official screen birthday party, then it, it would be the proper birthday party lock in. Yeah. And I'd, I'd have special guests every year and it'd just go off to yeah. like, we'd be in there, we'd be walking out and like, two days later, <laughs> like me, Sarah and like everyone like just coming out the back door like that. <laughs> yeah, that, that place like holds a very like special place in my heart. And I just saw like so many good DJs in there. Do you know what? Yeah, I saw so many people play. But for me, it was like, like I've had mates who, who produce now who got into music from there and they, they still say like, 
sitting down next to Quest or Silk here, like this. Mm-hmm. Everyone was so sound. Yeah, there's no backstage. I mean? Yeah, there was no moodiness either. Yeah. You had a couple of kick off, but it would generally be people who didn't weren't meant to be there, sort of thing, like piss heads who'd walk in or whatever. Not piss heads, but you know what I mean, like City Boys or whatever, who didn't really know what they're coming in for. And mm. like, because it was, you couldn't act like a dickhead in there. Yeah. Not that it was rough, but it was like you'd literally everyone would be like, "Who's this dickhead?" Yeah, yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like the yeah. toilets in it were absolutely outrageous. Horrendous. Outrageous, <laughs> man. I've got. I found some photos of my brother and and um, geezer called Military G in there. I found them on. i Scott found a load of photos on my Facebook for one of my birthdays. It was now funny looking back. But it was such a great place. Like the door staff was sound. Like Winston yeah. was so sound. So lovely, yeah. So sound. Whatever happened like, to Winston? I don't know. Do you know what? I bumped into him. A couple of years after it shut, he was working, I think he was doing a security job or something somewhere. Or I think he ended up retiring because I think he'd done so long. And I think he got glassed one, he got bottled once. It was so out of order. I don't know who done it. It was like a random. Mm. And I think I remember him going, ah, oh, fuck this, because he'd worked with plastic people for a reason. Yeah. It was all sound people. Yeah. And he didn't have to. It Deal was it really, it was just making sure everyone was safe, really, like searching people to see. It wasn't necessarily for drugs, do you know what I mean? It was, mm. it was not saying he didn't. I'm not saying he was letting you in drugs, but I mean, it was more it was more just a safety thing, as it should be, really. And that, that vibe at the club, that's what it was, wasn't it? It was just sound. Yeah. It was like everyone was all right. Yeah, it was a good place. It was a funny place. I remember my, I used to work there on Thursdays after I'd be at Rinse, and my main job was basically just to get DJ's drinks. And <laughs> mostly it was just like Red Stripe and whatever, but I always remember Youngster always had whiskey. Yeah. Like, and that was always like stuck well, in Hennessy, my mind. It? Yeah, it was something straight. Yeah. Just, like, just the class, just the glass. I remember a youngster when he did him used to I remember a youngster when he wouldn't even take a fucking Rizzler off someone. He was so <laughs> intense as he did. The first person he ever let hold a Rizzler for him was my ex, it was Charlotte, it was Jesse's mum. And, and I was thinking, does he fancy her or something? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, those times those times were wicked. It was great, like it shaped so many people's lives. Yeah. Like it shaped my life. Like it was like youth club. It was just like it was a home. It was like you I knew any night I went, I could pop in. I don't know what yeah. are. Like, so I didn't have any money on me. And I just sort of drink out. Like, like, I mean, yeah. not just because it was me, because it was like, it was just part of the family, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, I'd help out. I remember serving drinks when it got ma- massively packed once. Yeah. And like, they was understaffed. I remember going to serve drinks in there. <laughs> Can you imagine it? Me yeah. going to bar and serve drinks. <laughs> I saw a lot of like unexpected faces in there as well. I remember seeing, I remember Skrillex being there one. In plastic people, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Later, yeah. much I def- later. I, def- I went there then. Much, much later. He was there one night. Yeah. Um, I know, like Boy But I Know used to come in. And yeah, well, there's the famous yeah. request land story in it, and it was all in there. It's the famous picture. Yeah. PlayStation was playing, but so uh, they used to be there all the time. They, to be fair, even they come later on. Yeah, it was a bit later Like on, when yeah. I think about it, because when I think of Forward It, I've, I've, it's like from Velvet Rooms, and to, I remember the Turnmills parties, the Fabric parties. The first time I went in Fabric was for, was for Forward. Right, one of your records. Screaming Benga. Yes. The Judgment. Yes. Had to get one in there with Benny. I had to, yeah. This is the beginning of everything. This is the beginning of, like, of, as we were talking earlier about when, when things felt like they proper starting, like, there was having songs played in the club, but then getting you someone to vinyl wasn't easy, right? Like, it was, you'd have to have a record blowing up for at least a year mm. before someone even consider it. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, you remember hearing EZ play tunes in a club? Mm. Like, I remember sitting on tape going into the record shop with this 30 second clip going no no it's that one that one but it's like you used to have to graft it and then it was that one um, actually introed with it on the dubstep all stars yeah volume one and like quite iconic and then it was that was the intro and that was the first and up until Magnetic Man only record we'd done together was it really mm. I did not know that we couldn't ever finish a tune because we just talked nonsense and like right. we were kids <laughs> right so we'd be sitting there eating chicken and just like his mum, bless her. Um, we just we just sit there mucking about, and his brothers would come in, and we just couldn't. We could write 30, 40 tunes on our own, but together, we just could never. And I remember going to do that song because I was about sixteen. I just started a college that I weren't meant to be in. They put me on the wrong course, right. and I literally stayed. They put me on a media course. I wanted to do a music course. They put. I, the only reason I stayed was because. On the first week, they announced a trip to Amsterdam. <laughs> I'll never forget it. They took 200 of us to Amsterdam at six, 16 year old, just fucking belt off. Uh, but um, then, so Benny lived in Coolsdon. I went to school and I was going to college in Red Deal. So I'd get the train and I'd just walk up to his house. And I remember, mm. I'll, I'll never forget the day we done it because 
yeah, it just came together. And it was, um, yeah, it was it was screaming Benga. It was it was like on every magazine. It was every song of every, of the month in every magazine. And it was like that was because the thing is there was never scream and Benga. There was scream and there was Benga. Mm. And even after that record, there was still no scream and Benga. We yeah. didn't tour together. We didn't DJ together. Like it wasn't until much later where the actual scream and Benga as a duo yeah. came. Yeah. Really, it was just two kids who made a song together. We were mates. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was for me. That was the start of everything, really. And I think I listened to it the other day, man. It sounds, still sounds so ahead. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because it was still we were still on the back of Zed Bias and, and Steve Gurley and LB and Horsepower, but it was one of them where we fully could stand with the big boys, I guess. Yeah. Just kids. Yeah. Uh, it was that was a good. But for me, that was. He's like, look, he's been my brother forever. He's like, he's, he's, there's not many people that hold closer to my heart. It weren't family, do you know what I mean? And uh, it's just, for, it was, that was, it was a big thing, man. I can try and get hold of the vinyl now, the green one. <laughs> it's hard. It's, yeah, it's really hard, yeah. The, the boy owns DNR keeps all the big Apple vi coloured vinyls in a safe. Is he, really? <laughs> I story, think I yeah. have, what's the, what's the red one? So the red one is red. That's, that's the one I have. <laughs> that's the one I have. <laughs> Never believe it. Yeah. Uh, the blue one was Skank, green one was Judgment. So yeah, it was just, uh, it was... Considering, really, I don't think up yeah up until Magnetic Man, I don't think we did anything together. And then Magnetic Man came along a lot later. Mm, too far. Um, so Magnetic Man was originally Ben Granatha. I wasn't a part of it. Oh right, I didn't know that. So on my birthday at Fullwood, they had this idea. They'd done what's happening. Is everything cool? Yeah. And then they'd done it <laughs> the most ghetto, cheap fucking show. Like so, they'd done a back to back set behind a white sheet in plastic people. I remember that. I and it was like that. the problem was is so you could only see their shadows. But the yeah. problem with that was is. Ben had a fucking massive afro. <laughs> so behind a white sheet, and we could just see this afro, and it was like meant to be a top secret thing um, about who it was, and it was like, that was clearly Ben got. <laughs> that arthur could have been anyone, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But Benny's like, oh, fuck it. <laughs> but, um, but it was only, I got to be involved with Magnet Man, it was after we got a, a deal from the Prince's Trust, and okay. obviously I was pretty live, like it was screaming, blown and, and whatever, and it was, it was, it made sense for me to join up. But to be honest, it felt, it felt, um, I felt like I was invading someone else's project for quite a while until yeah. we actually did the album. And then I sort of, I felt involved. But up until then, it was sort of like, I didn't really, I sort of had my own thing, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And they all had their, I, sorry, all had their own things, but I never tried, never tried to get involved in anyone else's shit. And um, But it sort of made sense in the end. Yeah. Because yeah. it was the story behind us or whatever. But yeah, Magnetic Man was a wild time. I remember you guys going away to write an album and they had to like put you in the countryside somewhere. No, 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 no. They didn't have to. Arthur thought it'd be nice for us okay. to go down to a um, beautiful little uh, uh, little little town opposite Padstow in, in Durban. Beautiful place. But what they failed to remember is me and Bengra City Rats. Yeah. So we had cabin fever after about a week. <laughs> but me and, the first time me and Bengra ever argued. I, rem I remember being in the office and there being like a... Mate. The label, Columbia, come down, yeah, to see our progress, right? And the only song we'd written, like, I'm not sure on what I could say it, but the actual, the intro was Ketamine, check. Ecstasy, check. Cocaine, check. And we just, it was just a, a, a checklist of drugs, right? And it went into a mad electro song that sounded like Boys Noise. And, like, they put a lot of money into it, right? man. And we, they were paying a fortune for this house for us to build a studio. Come down after about three months, that was the only thing we had. <laughs> and they were like, I remember them going... Philippe, who was looking after us, he come down and went, I remember just looking at Mike Smith, who was the head at, uh, head at Columbia at the time, and they just sort of, sort of went, I guess we're just going to have to roll with it. <laughs> and the song never come out, it was a fucking belter. It sounded like, um, what was the song? Oh, some old Mr. Oizo thing. It, sounded, it was more or less a rip off of that, but with just a load of drugs, the drug names at the start. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was when... Um, we got a phone call. It was like, you don't need to fucking like, actually crack on here. Yeah. I was, I, like, cra I was like, crack on. I'm like, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember if it was like G or Sarah. They sent you a text about how you guys getting on. And you guys sent back a photo of your like weekly shop. Oh, no, it was mine and Benga's weekly shop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sweets. Sweets, booze and, yeah, sweets, booze and biscuits. Yeah, that was it. That was it. A <laughs> whole album. trolley. For, and that oh, was Arthur it. made a right big figure that he sent it to bloody everyone because <laughs> he was getting cheese and like stuff that would last, like sort of tinned foods. Me and Benny were just like, right. but the thing is, that's what we were like. It was, it weren't, it weren't like, um, we, the thing is, we weren't mucking about. Yeah. That's the thing. It's authentic. I, I noticed when I go down to Devon, 
I try and be more like a, when I go down to Devil Analog Studio, I try it because you have to do you do your shop before you get there. I try and be more of an Arthur, but I just can't get away from being a screaming bringer. <laughs> bare biscuits and sweets and fucking ice lollies. <laughs> <laughs> and let's talk about like your more recent work. Yep. Um, Screamism Eight. Yeah. There's a lot of like quite personal. Yeah. Records on there, isn't yeah, there? Yeah. Um, thinking of you, boy yeah. the boy. Yeah. What was like the process of writing this? Because it's been a while. So what happened was, so where I started writing 140 again in the, in the latter end of lockdown, um, so I hadn't done Screamism for like 10 years. And I've done a Screamism and it was a dubstep one. And like loads of people hate me for this, but I scrapped it because it sounded like I was trying to make records that I've made before. And it's just never watched one. I've been about two, what Screamism was about. Screamism was about was a snapshot in time. Um, well, not unfortunately, but during this snapshot of time, I was writing, my mate passed, and so a lot of, like, Roy the Boy, um, I'm Not Ready Yet, were made the night he passed. And it was like, it was, I just, I didn't write, the Scream is a mate that, that came out, wrote itself, it was just happened, like I'd done the song with Trim. Hit, the track Hit, I did at Devon Analog, I think, maybe in the first lockdown or pre-lockdown. But I remember listening back to Hit, like the first track, and I was like, I feel like this is the start of something. Mm. And then it just re itself, like, it's mad because it's the only record I've ever written that's reflected actually my feeling at the time. So, like, Thinking of You was initially a voice note. Like, you've probably read this, and other people have probably heard me say this, but it was originally a voice note. I was having a bit of a meltdown during the second end of lockdown. I just thought about, I was thinking about the kids and fucking, and whatever. And I wrote this note, like to the kids, like just letting them know everything will be all right and et cetera. And then I ended up recording that on my phone and then put it on the screen. And I was like, because it was never meant to be anything. It was just, I was just having a fucking feeling sorry for myself and whatever. And then I ended up putting some drums under it and then, because initially, when when I had put the drums under it and ripped some keys and everything, I was going to send it to... Basically, I was thinking about everyone who just had kids. Jamie Winston had just had a kid, who's a good friend of mine. Annie Mack had just, I think, had her second, and Pro mm. Green. Mm -hmm. I sent it to Pro Green, and basically, he just recorded my message back to me, and it felt really impersonal. Jamie Winston done the same. Maybe I didn't really give him much of a, um, a brief, but I was like, look, this could be a really special thing. And it was like, when they said it back, they was just saying my words back to me. I was like, no, nah, because it don't hit. It, it's not that, my... It's your story, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And then I had a recorded version. Chloe come in, heard it and cried. Mm. Literally burst into tears. And a couple of other people I was like, this is really special. And I don't like my voice on record, like really. But the saying about me saying it that really resonates and hits people. Roy the boy, look, I was saying I don't mean that getting into, but it's, it's, that's that's his voice on, on Roy the boy. It was a voice note on the night. My mate had it on his phone. So and I was just like, basically I locked myself in the studio on that night and I was just writing to like drown out what was going on. And then you got things like, like I'm not ready yet. That was the same night. And so it was his first realistic, it's the first proper personal record I've done. And like, it's, I think it's my best body of work ever. Like easily without a shadow of doubt, and that's over Magnet Man, that's over over Scream, that's over Outside the Box. I think it's my best production to date. I think it's best structures. I think it's original. I think, and it sounds like me, which is the main thing. The the one that I scrapped sounded like me trying to sound like me, mm. which is an oxymoron in itself. But I mean, it's it just didn't feel right. And then the way this one come together, I've got to shout out Platoon, um, the guys at Platoon all the time because they was they put so much into it. Got a shout out to Inza for the artwork because it was just the record was so retrospective. Like even like when I say Inza, there's one of my favourite graffiti artists growing up as a kid who knew my mates, who like we'd never met, and then like I'd used to buy his uh, apparel and and like it was just mad. Like even working with Trim, that goes back to Screamism Six mm -hmm. and like the very retrospective record and I, and I, that's in BPM, that's in sound, that's in and 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 I think it sounds like the music I was set out to make. Yeah, personally. Do you find like, as you, cause you've been in the, like, the game for so long, mm. do you find like, as you get older and you're still in it, there's like a sense of freedom again, like the freedom that you experienced when you first started? Now, 
now, like, I got wrapped, like, not wrapped up in, like, where, when I stopped playing dubstep, when I moved into house, like, I, I realised I was playing everyone else's game. Yeah. Whether that be producer, whether that be DJ, and, and then that's where you fuck up. And then I'm like, like, I, I had such a big career before then, and I've always done what I wanted to do, regardless of who told me otherwise. And I got lost a little bit. Like, don't get me wrong, I've had fun. Like, still enjoy myself. I'm still playing how to play, but like, I play it how I want to play it, and I make what I want to make, and I do what I want to do, because I always did, and that's mm. how I got to where I, where I am. Yeah. And but sometimes you forget that because you start playing to other people's fiddle. And uh, yeah, but like, it's like I'm in a. As I said at the start, I feel very blessed to be still be here, and actually, I realised after lockdown, I could actually do what I want to do, not like in a in a leery way of I can do what I want yeah. like but I can do what I'm going to do and people want me to do what I do because that's why they like me yeah, yeah. so um, yeah in, in that way like now I've, I've got to keep going all out <laughs> that's why I started doing dubstep stuff again like it's not no no it's not why I'm, like that come naturally again mm. Um, but it's like I'm working on I'm going to work with the Big Pink now I've done a song with Piers from The Claws on Thursday done a sc song with Screaming uh, uh, Screaming Benga done a song with Benga and Koki last night mm. but then I've also made like fucking four like four, four bang, new banging house things ready for Circo Loco but that's sick that's so exciting for you no though. I love it I yeah. love it but, but it's, the thing is if I don't do that I become stagnant and I get bored yeah. and I become I don't really enjoy what I'm doing yeah. and it's like the main look I'm on the latter end. Well, I don't, I don't want to say the latter end because I don't want to like jinx anything. But I mean, like, I want to go legacy now, yeah. like legacy here and now. Yeah. Because it's um, not for any other reason. But I've built up so many links with people over the years. It's like, like my phone book ain't like the normal person's phone book. Like whether it be Ronson or or, or Arthur. But I was about, I had lunch with Arthur Baker. He's working on the next record I'm working on. Like like it's like. He said, I need to take advantage of these, of the, of the, of the not take advantage of the people. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely awful. But I mean, like, I've got the, the links there to do something really, really special, which next it's year, next year is uh, yeah, when it's going to happen. What does, like, what, what does a legacy for you look like? Legacy for me is just being here. Yeah. Legacy is, is actually still being wanted to be here. But what I mean is, like, I'm at the best. Personally, I think I'm at the best I've ever been production-wise, <clears throat> and want and am ready to go be being better. Like not yeah. even better, but like it's it's taken me 20 years to get what I hear in my head into a computer, which I know most people might think that sounds stupid, but it's a really hard thing to do to actually get what you hear. Like whether it's a melody, whether it's it's a vocal line, whether it's drums, like anything, I can now do that. And it's like I'm excited mm. for because my ear, I live on my ear, right? And I know what like, I know what I believe is good songs and whatever, and, and I believe I'm making good songs, so everyone's fucked basically. <laughs> 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 I'm joking, but um, no, but I feel really confident, and I've never, I've never really been confident as much as I, 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 I come across like that. Mm. But that's only because I'm, I, I'm good at the social game. But I've never really been overly confident. I was never the best at. I weren't ever the best producer. I weren't ever the best at anything. But like, that took uh, to my my people in my peripheral. So, like, but I feel I'm at my best, and like, I know, I know the thing is, I know I can be a beast when it comes to writing. Yeah. Like, cause I've always, it's always been celebrated. Like, well, not celebrated, but it's always been a smoke up thing. Like, I can write rapid, and I can do it. I do a lot when I go, and I'm at like I've never felt confident. In fact, now I feel confident. I'm like. I feel like it's just getting started now. Do you think that's just come with like experience? It's come with experience. It's come with with mistakes. It's come with 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 just just acknowledging that I, like that I'm lucky like, lucky to still be. And when I say lucky, some people say no, like, you've worked for it or whatever. It don't matter. I've seen people work themselves into the ground and disappear. Mm. So it's just um, I think it's acknowledging certain things like just whether it be having a breather. Like or uh, or just choosing your own battles, basically. Mm. Otherwise, it's when you're fighting all other people's battles, it's when you fuck yourself. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to chat about it a little bit. You've been uh, quite public with it, but your choice to go, go stints or do stints with sobriety. I, yeah, yeah, I did. I did two months. It was just like if you if you'd have seen the people like the parties I was just not inviting and I'd be for it. It was just like fucking hell. The thing what I realised, this was the bit where I was like, what, what, 
this is not this ain't no offense to no one or like whoever is this who, who thinks they were there what i'm talking about like it was nothing happened that much. like what it was is i just had this just bit of clarity maybe it was the acid no i'm joking <laughs> um but it was just um i looked around and every no one around me had um I'd put it like um like life collateral, like whether it be mortgage, whether it be house, whether it be kids, whether it be whatever. Yeah. They could do what they're doing, roll on how they're doing, because they can. Like they're really good money or like whatever. But I was like, I've actually got kids people that need looking after, like and and, and things I need to be kid on and like that slipped a little, like not slipped, but like it was just like was a bit reckless, you know what I mean? And it was just like, oh, fuck this, I need a break from it. And this first break I had, like, fucking since I was about 12. Yeah, which is fucking mad. Piece of piss, though. Yeah. Piece of piss. So all you have to do is prioritise your time. Right. Go to a gig, go home. Yeah. It's That's easy. basically what I do. Like, and, that, and, that, and that sounds, that's, look, I have to point out, my dad's black. 20 years so well, like, he works for AA, works at Bethlehem Mental Hospital, so I'm not, I'm not saying it's that easy, but I mean, my bit isn't, it's not like, you won't like, it's it's the party is the issue. Right. Because it's not like, I don't go home and then go and do whatever. I just go home and go to bed. Yeah. So it's just prioritising your time, really. Like, pick your flights. Don't get there first thing in the morning. Get there with, like, a reasonable time before. Like, never get the last flight out. That's always a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, like, get there two hours before when you're due to play. Go to the hotel. Sort your shit out. Yeah. Go there, go home, get first flight out. Yeah. So I found it fairly easy. Do you think those two months are going to change? The thing is, my pals, like, when, when I did that, my mates all did the same. Right. Yeah. Or when I was there. And it's easier when your mates are doing the same. Yeah, way. yeah, they'd come in the booth to make sure. Like, like, it wasn't like, it's, look, the thing what, but the, the thing what not stressed me out is other people take it on as their problem. That's what really stressed me out. Right. And it's like, if I wanted to have a drink during that time, I'd have a drink. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But it's yeah. when other people start making their problems really annoyed me. In what, in what way? Like, it'd be like, I could see people like to call them up. I remember I was playing in Circo, the, the, the DC, I'd fucking, I could see someone going, no, you're not allowed to drink around him. I turned around and said, yeah, I saw you fucking self. Right? I said, I want people to have a good time when I'm playing, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, like, it's, it's your choice, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, it wasn't like a thing where phew, I was found in a crack house with a shotgun, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It was, yeah. It was just, I had, I had a break. Like, it was, and it was, it shouldn't have affected, like, so many people shouldn't have got involved. It was like, I'm, 30, I'm nearly 40. Yeah. Like, I want a break. Not everyone else has got to do it, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's other people seem, other people like getting involved in other people's shit, don't they? Yeah, yeah, and it was like it wasn't. No one told me to do it. It was just like for, like I realised that I've got like there's. It was it was more of a thing of realising what I've got. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it was like I just had to break for a bit. Sound. The only thing was I was drinking about thirty fucking Lucky Saints set. They like, taste disgusting, but no, nah, Lucky Saints <laughs> good. Like lucky them? Saints are good. I yeah, I like no, no. Nah, nah, I don't normally like not like with beer. So there's always Saint missing, but Lucky Saints is another good one. I'm not sure. I'm like, talking about branding or whatever. Right, it's not sponsored. But there's um there's a good um the Brooklyn Lager one's nice and all. I like it when I when I go barbecue. I always have to. Have to cause I still drink non alcoholic beer. Yeah, still have it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, cause I don't really. I don't drink beer to get pissed. Can't get pissed on beer anyway. I'm <laughs> big yeah. spirit drinker when I drink. Do you know what I mean? So, so I like a Lucky Saint really. What was it like DJing sober? Easy. Like, yeah. When was it that? It's like, it's like riding a bike in up and DJing since I was 11. If I can't DJ sober, I'm fucking useless. Yeah. <laughs> I actually enjoyed it more. I ended yeah, up like, enjoying it I was, more. I was, I was, people pointed out, like, people was like, like, my first, my first show was at DC, which was, it was an hard one to do, but I thought, fucking, if you could go there, it's, when I say it's a hard one to do, it's because it's going to be for everyone who's living out there, all your pals or whatever. But my mates were like, my mates would, well, I said, I drink, and I was like, ah, fucking sweet. We won't either. Mm. What do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Weren't like a thing. Because I'm like, but I did ask no one to do anything. It was just, uh, it was right. I was on the point. Like, but I mean, I'd like to think I'm on point anyway. <laughs> yeah. See <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't like, it's not fucking the hardest thing in the world to do, is it? It's like, you you pay more attention to the room. Is one thing I will point out, right. rather than playing to your mates or in the booth. Yeah, you know, yeah. Turning around, going, yeah, yeah, you fucking go mad. Yeah. But it was, I was paying more attention to the room, definitely. Yeah. Like, although I'm blind as a bat, I could only see about the first two rows most of the time anyway, but it was, yeah, it was definitely, like, I had it off, so like, two months of the season. So, like, that was, that was closing as well. I think I had, it was two months in, and then closing. Closing, I got right closing, stuck in. Closing, closing. <laughs> closing, I got right stuck in. Um, but, um, yeah, but, uh, no, I found it, um, and oh, I'll probably do it, love to do it, for, like, like, once a year or something. Yeah. Just break it, especially IP for... And people get so mad that it's like, look, everyone knows, like, my lot are like the Avengers of the parties. In. They're like, it's like, they're, like the full last one standing. We've got Thanos, we've got everyone. Like, <laughs> But it's like, it's, it gets a lot. And it's the thing is, 
you start to realise you start to become one of the oldest in the room as well which ain't it's not a particularly nice feeling sitting in someone's gaff at seven in the morning and like knowing that you're going to feel rough in a couple of days and they're not yeah <laughs> I always say I was like the you get older but the crowds stay the same age well did but you see the mad thing for me is you got to think my crowd of my age all the way through until yeah. now until now because <laughs> right, yeah. everyone my age is retired from the party scene married kids working in office you know what I mean <laughs> so when I go and pick the kids up from school it's like I can't tell everyone what's happening at the weekend I, ask them, to I say to you, oh, do you have a nice weekend? Like, you're trying to be like a like, parent or not. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, two glasses of wine and Chinese. Mental. <laughs> like, what do you get up to? I'm like, it's a quiet one. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? If I told them, they'd be like, ah, fucking kids will probably get taken away. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Let's look, quickly touch on Ibiza. Because we're running out on a bit of time. But um, What a Fool Believes, Aretha Franklin. Oh. This reminds you of... So this is when I had the apartment behind space. Me and Jack Foster had, had a gaff together. 2014. And I just remember it was mental, this gaff, mad, this gaff. We were quite new new on the island. And I remember people would come back to our gaff and we wouldn't play house or techno. Like, we wouldn't have it. You weren't allowed, like, anything that was played in the club, you didn't play at the afters. And I think it's still the way it should be. Like, play, we play party tunes and that. We used to always play this game best song in the world it's an impossible question but you end up having a right good party because it's all just belters all that mm-hmm. and this was an iconic one there was uh, all the boys from Glasgow come over it was about the apartment probably only held 20 there was about 30 of us no balcony or a little balcony about the side of that table and this song coming on just everyone I just remember every, the sun coming out and everyone just going ah, what a fool please but it's uh, such a belt it holds a special place in my heart and I've got um one last question for you. So we basically try and do this with everyone that comes on. Mm. You don't know who the next guest is, but if you had to give one record to that person so we could buy the vinyl record and give it to them. Photek Complex. What would it be? That one. Photek Complex, yeah. Why that one? Best song ever made. <laughs> Best most one, like literally it was made in what, 96, 97? Photek Complex, it was like, between 96 and 98, I think, or 95, 97. Between man that era and it's, I remember playing it at Fabric. I nicked it out my brother. I nicked it off my brother. I actually still have the copy I nicked of him. And it's literally still to this day, it sounds like the future. Photek is a G. Like unbelievable. Like, can you listen to the drum program on that? Not to sound like a geek here, but it's still in a world where drum bass is like a fully fledged thing and, and it's still pro like it's still top notch production. Them drums on that song are untouchable. Photek complex all day, every day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Mervis. It's so nice to see you. It's been too long. It's been long. Moments in music.